Welcome to Marvin Blog Solo, and today we're talking demography, polling, and how Marxists can read these things critically and not just project or ignore facts that are bourgeois cultural opposition um, know and use. Worldwide, for the past um, 15 years, there, there have been many people been noting that um, demagogic politics, particularly leaning right, has been emerging from highly complex um, political arrangements repeatedly as various financial crises and um, other kinds of concerns hit the wall, mostly related to climate change, if we're honest. The first right-wing vibe shift was actually probably in Europe and in the peripheries of Asia. And it happened during the Obama administration when no one was looking. And then there was a shift back to a kind of liberal, our left, social democratic center in places like Korea and in various places in Europe. And we finally have seen this as the Christian Democrats have ended their long tenure in Germany. We have seen the reemergence of what looked like it could be a pink wave break on the rocks of the Fed's financial policy and the coordination of most of the of the integrated financial system of the Anglosphere in Europe raise its rates to combat global inflation. And it was predicted for a long time and, and both off of the general patterns of, of the American electorate, but also off of uh, prior disaffiliations with progressivism and liberalism. And I'll get to why that's important in a minute. That you would see a somewhat significant um, shift in politics back towards the right the way we saw in 2010, the way we saw in 2001 and 2002. Although we must admit the 9-11 the attacks uh, really did majorly shift political opinion in America rightward in a way that is different than now and doesn't really model to now. But looking over recent demographic studies, we see that um, according to the Mo Morning Consult and the Pew poll, America is getting far less liberal, far less leftist um, in its identification. Although some of this is limited by the fact that the number of ideologies amongst the under 35 set has increased somewhat dramatically, many of them hostile to liberalism. Um, some of them, you know, outright Marxist Leninist to, you know, anarchist to mega communism. There's all kinds of, of strange things. But what we have seen is an increasing skepticism to disaffiliation with parties, a ambivalence about Black Lives Matter um, along people of color with with different demographic groups feeling differently about it. We have seen increasingly the paradox that, that people haven't really asked themselves for a long time. In every pupil I've ever seen, um, people identifying as slightly liberal, liberal, or very liberal, or leftist, um, we're never more than, say, 35, 30%, of, 36% of the population. Whereas many Democrats identify as conservative. So in a country where it seems like there's high pol uh, polarization in the media and national expression, 
of politics, you have to ask yourself, well, then why do 45% of, excuse me, not quite 45%, why do about 35% of Democrats view themselves as somewhat conservative? The most recent polls have indicated that the majority of Americans are abandoning identification with liberalism. Progressivism, which has never been more than between 9 and 11 ascent, according to Pew, Pew, the last major Pew demographic study on political identification from uh, 2021, which I've used before, indicated that um, the progressive left was self-identified as only about 9 to 10% of the population. Uh, uh, and its demographics were almost entirely college educated, mostly white, and um, very concerned about racial bias against people of color, which is, you know, kind of not what you would think, not what the average leftist would tell themselves anyway. The morning consult data that I read indicates that this is actually even more extreme now, and I will share all these links for you. Identification um, nationally would, on the spectrum of liberal, very liberal, somewhat liberal, a leftist, dropped from 34% to 27% between 2017 and 2022. And the survey was not a small sample size. It was over uh, 8.6 million voters who were used for the survey. During Trump's tenure, alignment with the right actually declined fairly severely and particularly amongst the young. And while youth are highly motivated to vote in the next election and many cultural issues of which Democrats are pushing pull well with them, access to abortion, um, limiting speech codes uh, from things like Florida, uh, relative, pr relative protections of, of the rights of trans people and and gay marriage, um, there is also a sense that the talking points of progressives are seen as largely a college phenomenon. So Democratic voters have shifted back towards the middle, back towards triangulation, and Republican voters have shifted fairly far right amongst every racial demographic. We've also seen increasing disaffiliation of people of color with, with liberalism and progressivism, although this has not translated, according to the Morning Consult, with disaffiliation with the Democratic Party. While broadly speaking, most progressive issues poll well. Progressives do not. Now, this is not new that this is the case. And it's hard to parse the data because we know that the demographers are stuck on models of politics um, where the spectrum is just liberal to conservative. Um, and this is the dominating model for how they view all of American politics. We saw in 2020 talk of a, of a Latin shift and an African-American shift, particularly of African-American men. And there was a shift of Latin and, and black conservatives from uh, Latin and black Republicans who identified as moderates to conservatives. And, and some of those numbers are staggering in in relative scale, an increase, for example, of black Republicans um, going up to 
uh, viewing viewing themselves as conservative or very conservative to about 50 percent, as opposed to moderates, which was by far the larger identification of black Republicans in the Trump and pre-Trump eras. But we also must remember that black Republicans are a very, very small demographic. All right. We've also seen that in general, the Republican Party is viewed as more extreme by the general public. And in, in 30 um in 2017, 36% of the pop, of the population thought that the Republican Party was, quote, too conservative. Now, still, despite all the shifts away from the Democrats and progressives, it is up. To, it is still amongst 42% of voters. As I have warned people before, one of the things that the left did in its strategies was move people back into alliance with the Democratic Party. Seemingly given, given conservatives the anti-systemic force. But given that conservatism now seems more extreme, it also seems less coherent. Neither the moral majority religious rhetoric nor the Paul Ryan um, libertarian rhetoric really dominates the party, even if, by and large, their policies have not changed much. If you look at what's coming out of uh, Rick Scott in Florida, you have the same neoliberal de uh, privatization, public-private partnerships, et cetera, et cetera, as we've had before. You've had cultural issues, but cultural issues in which Republicans have to pivot wildly between their base and the general public as there is an increasing disconnection between them. But what does this say about class? What does it say about the likelihood of the 2022 or 24 election going in any particular way? And how has the left not been able to understand what this meant? Well, some of the things driving this moderation is that amongst the young and amongst people of color, there has been de-urbanization during COVID. And college graduates, particularly amongst men, are decreasing at a somewhat significant level and are drawn out to increase more and more in the future because the cost of college and its benefits and the jobs available just don't really seem to align. Although this may change, again, as it looks like recession looms. The irony is that many of the demographic trends that I heard many on the left assume were true, and this includes in their tailing of either MAGA communism or of the DSA's increasing concessions with being a regional faction of the Democratic Party uh, in major cities, largely in the Rust Belt in New York and in California. After all, there have been 120 DSA candidates elected to office, but the DSA's membership has been becoming more and more inactive, and many chapters have not even been able to make quorum since COVID. Increasingly, it's hard to see how the Democratic Socialist of America will not end up being a kind of slightly socialist adjacent progressive caucus that has local arms in the two coastal megapoles and in some of the Midwestern cities, and in the class character of those areas would be different. But as an independent movement and a consolidation of the larger sectarian movements into something like a viable left, this seems to be over. And indeed, I have not been able to find reports on recent membership numbers going into the new convention. But I can say anecdotally that hype and discussion of the DSA has declined dramatically in 2022. Furthermore, despite what DSA and co. would, would like you to believe, left identification 
is and liberal identification both are higher amongst white voters than non-white voters. While on the Republican side, there's been a different shift. White voters have become slightly more conservative. They were already fairly conservative, being the remnants of the declining evangelical church, largely aligned to the to the Republican Party, the petite bourgeoisie, and the in the Sun Belt, largely aligned with the Republican Party, was already fairly conservative. So there was less of a shift to happen. But Black Republicans, as I said, have increased identifying uh, rig with conservatism from around 37% to around 60%. Whereas Latin Republicans have, have also identified more with conservatism from about 48 to 50% to almost 66 to 70%, somewhere in there. Non-white voters are making up a larger share of both coalitions and the messaging has changed, which is why while white nationalist talking points may go away, it's not surprising that you see Alex Jones flirting with rehabilitating Kanye's uh, flirtations with black Israelism or the Proud Boys and the National Conservative Movement putting up more and more people of color in their leadership. And the idea that this was a tr completely white movement is just not true. Now it is a majority white movement. And in the South, where there is very, very little political elasticity, um, racial identification is actually the best predictor of voting. But that's not true for the most for all the country and for every subdemographic group. And I'm going to list that here. There's also been a demobilization of Latin voters, but despite fears that they would abandon the Democratic Party, at least some of the Pew voters, of the Pew people um, polls have indicated that, that Latin people do feel like um, the Democrats as a whole still have their interest. But that is, the, that is kind of hard to square with the reality of the situation on things like immigration. The number of undocumented immigrants in detention centers um, has increased more than 50% since Biden took office. All right. No matter how you cut that, that's a bad stat. No substantive immigration reform has been on hand and the, deten and the detention of asylum seekers uh, has actually increased. Whether or not this is from more aggressive enforcement on the Biden administration, more, more attempts at immigration from Central America, or both, is actually not entirely clear to me, and I've read a lot on the subject and have worked with groups. Meanwhile, a lot of the activist groups that were, that were concerned about the issue in the Trump administration have fallen away, including many Latin ones, to be honest. This is not just hypocrisy. It is systemic inability to reform. And I have mentioned that we'll see this over and over with the Biden administration. Many things will be attempted through executive reform like they would with Obama, and the Supreme Court will likely limit or strike back parts of these executive orders. But very few people will be watching. And this brings me to the last interesting thing for Marxism and the counter-systemic forces. If the right is seen as a counter-systemic force, people frustrated with the current political order to an extreme and who are not just depoliticized, which seems to be the majority. While, while we see young people, including many young Zoomers, uh, pledging to vote, although that happens, that's happened. The pledges to, for, for youth increase in voting has happened since the 90s, and it's really only been a real practice since Donald Trump. There is a real chance that this is a change in political culture where the young actually do come out and vote more. Furthermore, with life expectancy 
amongst rural Americans dropping, a lot of the elderly just aren't there. Now, we're still a disproportionately aging country, and things are very, very, very hard in that regard. And life expectancy has stagnated or declined in most areas for most non-rich demographics. But it's important to think about this in a real sense. Furthermore, there are some trends that should concern liberal Democrats amongst people of color. Even amongst educated people of color, identification with liberals and leftists has declined. Now I say liberals and leftists. There could be a there could be a fluke in this polling where certain kinds of leftists are not accounted for and maybe read as moderates because they do not identify as liberals. That is definitely a possibility, but it is very hard to know since there is an explicit moderate identification whose membership has increased. Black voters will increase as a percentage of the population, although Latin voters will have increased more. And the fastest growing sub-demographic is Asian American voters, who are about 57% Democratic and significantly wealthier as an aggregate than their Black and Latin subgroups. But we should always put an asterisk on these when we talk about these in terms of polling. And I want you to think about this because um, different immigrant classes from Asia have very different histories, accumulations of wealth, etc. And this is also true from, Lat from Latin America. I've been trying to get better data on which groups went more conservative beyond Cubans and, and immigrant Venezuelans, for example. Um, and that data has been complicated. But the, we've had proxies to it, for example, like the situation in South Texas. And one of the reasons why it is complicated is that a lot of even documented immigrants um, uh, are people related to documented immigrants, might know undocumented immigrants, and are hesitant to give away certain key information, even if they vote, and have been naturalized. So it's not easy to get all that data. So what do we see? Well, we see that there's an increasing class divide in, in the identification with liberalism and leftism. But conservatism is not necessarily filling the gap. This may explain the plethora of weird, seemingly internet-only ideologies that we've seen in the last year. Bubble up to disaffiliate with the DSA and to disaffiliate with the Democratic Party, or to at least, even if staying affiliated with Dem the Democratic Party, disaffiliate with liberals and with leftists who are seen as adjacent to them. While in America, for the first time in my memory, there is a clear distinction in the common parlance between leftists and liberal, even amongst the everyday American, which complicates a lot of this polling, which is not reflected that identification. There is some attempt in the Pew polls to actually reflect that. They talk about the outsider leftist or the outsider left, um, but in that they included both people who would be uh, worker populist, moderates, people who don't really share an ideology. But this has also been true in the Republican side. The coalition of evangelical conservatives, libertarians, and neoconservatives has been decaying on the Republican side since the late 90s. And Trump, even more than the Tea Party, broke that apart. However, under the post-Trump era, an attempt to use some allegiance to Trump to paper over the differences has been somewhat effective as a personality and an oppositional politics and a paranoid politics. 
has become more dominant in American life. But we've also seen a strong move away by progressives and left liberals from the rhetoric of critical race theory, privilege, etc. Whether or not they ever meant it is a whole other question. But as leftists have been frustrated with returns to tough on crime talk, there has been a real sense in which even amongst people of color and even with a strong distrust of police still in those communities, defunding the police and talk of police abolition has lost a lot of its potential support. And that makes some sense. After all, it was tried half-assedly. I will link all these things that I'm getting my information from, but I now want to close on the Marxist part of it. Marxist, as part of this weird coalition of different kinds of socialists and communists that have been in coalition with progressives all the way since the 1930s, have often relied on downwardly mobile college educated people for their base. One, the sectarian organizations often needed people who had a lot of leisure time. Two, after the 1950s, Marxists were often shut out of formal organization and unions. Three, while new unions in certain areas of retail and logistics have been growing at a small pace, most unions saw decline during COVID and Marxists have not been part of the reconstitution. If anything, identifying with either the counter-systemic forces of the right, which are seen as too destabilizing, or with progressives, leaves us holding the bag, and the majority of the population is moving on, and in frustration, depoliticizing. Because the other thing, the other most interesting thing I found on Pew doing research for this, well, there's two, is that almost every faction of American politics right now sees its political side as losing. And that's interesting. All sides think they are losing. And yet no one, socialist, national conservatives, communist, anarchist, Georgist, whatever. None of these explicitly and highly and somewhat and sometimes quite arcane counter-systemic forces has really been able to channel that frustration anywhere productive, not even in a parapolitical and non-electoral way. It is a detente of mutual frustration, and that frustration has moved from radicalizing to conservatizing to depoliticizing in the course of one and a half presidential administrations. In the long durée, this should be compared to what some of the many cycles that have happened since the profitability crisis of the 70s. And someone maybe it will have to be me, <laughs> needs to start digging into these polling datas and seeing how the economic turns and twists played with these seeming realignments, which have mostly ended up being rebrandings. The prediction of political realignment since, since the end of the liberal consensus with the profitability crisis in the 1970s has come true once. And that was the neoliberal realignment under Reagan. And movement conservatism came from an obscure outsider sect within the Republican Party to being the political force that even if people were not a part of, they had to align themselves against and set their terms against. The class character of that was obscured as it made appeals to the working class in the 80s, and I know that seems strange to us now, and seemed to have make, made some real strides after some of the unions were busted up, 
particularly the working class in the South and the Sun Belt. But that wasn't maintained for very long. And indeed, most poor people voted for Democrats. And the Democrats were able to complete neoliberalization with the blessing, seemingly, of their working class base, who they proceeded to piss on in the Clinton years. Triangulating with the conservatives to do things even Reagan could not get away with. That was a real realignment. And then there was a major temporary alignment with neoconservative foreign policy for the first few years after 9-11. But a president with an approval rating of almost 90% and had a disapproval rating of almost 52% prior to 9-11 saw that all dissipate within a matter of two years, almost losing the 2004 election and definitely becoming one of the most popular presidents in memory up to that time, and one of the most unpopular presidents in memory up to that time afterwards. Marxists have not figured out how to get the class angle on this, and in such have been flailing and tailing. And those of us who can critique this have a lot, have a lot to answer for as well, because we have not been able to really put the ground, what a meaningful program to build what we want without just screaming, we need to build a party. We need to build a party. Like that old meme. X, build it on the internet, X, profit. Well, create an ideology, create a set, create a tendency, create a caucus, X, party. Has never happened. And he attempts to do so by focusing on executive elections or focusing on the squad or using the DSA and the dirty split to eventually form a party within the democratic base by breaking them off. None of these had had any significant success. Where the DSA goes is hard to say. It is now part of the institutional apparatus of at least New York progressives. Maybe also Bay Area and South California progressives and socialists. And it also has significant representation in Rust Belt and Black Belt cities, despite being a majority right organization. But we have no idea what that will mean. And we have a lot of evidence from the beginning of the year that the DSA's membership is declining. And we have even more evidence that its activity is declining. Like many right-wing groups under Trump, a detente with the president of the party one is adjacent to has hollowed out one's base because it becomes clear a lot of one's base was merely in opposition to a president and an executive force. We must think about how these trends speak to how we would build something as a platform to begin to build a viable socialist movement in America. And by that, I don't mean just breaking the Overton window. Now, I have not spoken about this much on this show, although I spoke a lot about it on uh, on the last three, diving into the wreckage with Sean over at Antifada. We are seeing the right do better than expected, even in places where there was a pink wave at the end of COVID. As of today, Bolsonaro's party did better in the Brazilian Congress than expected, and Lula and Bolsonaro inch closer and closer to being at parity each round of the runoffs. As of today, the Chilean constitutional left-wing drift has failed. The Pinochet constitution stands. As of today, many, many left-wing initiatives are over. <laughs> 
And given that the Greens and the SPD will probably have to answer for, for their inability to deal with the energy policy of Europe and the Ukraine-Russia crisis and war, we probably don't have a lot of hopes for them. And the center-left parties in many of the periphery Western European countries are being defeated from the right, and sometimes, like in Italy, the fur right. The great vibe shift is happening, but in America and Canada, it's hard to tell if it's going to go right or not. But what we can say is that it is not going left. We have to ask ourselves what role we played in that and why. Have a good day.